some exchange betting companies run short-lived promotions, like months-long offers of low commission. At BetDAG, we wanted to change the way we did things, so we set our commission at 2% permanently. That's 2% on football, horse racing, golf, almost any sport. 2%. That's just one way that BetDAG is changing for the better. For the better, like you. BetDAG, the 2% commission exchange. Over 18s only, please gamble responsibly. Welcome back to the Roker Report podcast where we are thrilled to announce that Sunderland Association Football Club have not played this weekend, no. Due to us having so many amazing international players, our game against Fleetwood has been rearranged and so the rest of League One gets to move on without us, with our next game being, of course, Wembley. So, we thought it best here at Roker Report Hours just to have a chat about a whole bunch of stuff, Sunderland or otherwise. We made a poll. Or not, not a poll, we made a tweet, just a tweet, we can call it that, on Twitter. Made a tweet? Made a tweet. Remember that one? Don't. Don't don't start this again. <laughs> I was in a good mood, <laughs> and, and now you're pushing us a bit there, Gav. Sorry. Rapport. Rapport. Yes, rapport. So yeah, Gav's yes. in the studio, Gav's back. Hello. Hi. I haven't been on in a while. I, uh, I missed you until about 15 seconds ago, <laughs> and now I want you gone again. I'm like Benji Kimbioka. I'm I'm just called him when needed. Like, ah, that's it. Like, that's it. Yeah, yeah, sh- yeah. Sorry, I'm just slipping my shoes off. Yeah, <laughs> and much like Kimbioka, you only ever really seem to make an appearance on the sort of less conventional sort of yeah, episodes, like the early know? early check trade games. Uh, basically, yeah. yeah. I mean, this. I mean, this. First of all, we've also got Johnny here as well. <laughs> oh, How are you doing, for Johnny? Yeah. Acknowledging me. Yes, nice yeah. to have you. Yeah, nice yeah. To yeah. Have you our company, our studio stalwart, the man himself, <laughs> the yes, gold indeed. Smith. The man of gold here. Yeah, when I'm not like forgetting the podcast is getting recorded, I'm not locked in the bathroom. Oh, that was unreal, that, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So. you've really been through the ringer, you have, Johnny. We made a tweet, made a tweet on Twitter, <laughs> asking <laughs> you for just some random questions about Sunderland or otherwise. And we've got about a good 30 in total to go through, so that thread, if you... How, how many co- of them did I submit, though? I reckon about three, but we'll, yeah. we'll say them anyway, because yours are pretty good, to be fair. Cool. Yeah, you know. So if you were tuning in, um, hoping for a real podcast, you, you might want to tune out, because that's not what this is. But before we get into that in detail, there, there are some real substantial things we can talk about. Obviously, the entirety of League One that isn't Sunderland or Fleetwood played yesterday, and so there are results on the board which put us in, perhaps on paper, a worse position. I don't know what you guys think, but I'm a little bit uncomfortable that Portsmouth are getting some breathing space from us. I mean, I actually think next Sunday's game is going to be a big decider in how the momentum swings, actually. Although it's not a league game, I just feel as though winning against Portsmouth when we're gunning for the same position in the league is is going to psychologically mm-hmm. maybe work in, in our favour if we can do that. But no, I, I'll be honest with you, I'm quite comfortable with having the, the games in hand. I'm gutted that Barnsley got that goal right at the death yesterday. Like I just, I felt, I felt as though Walsall were going to do us a favour, but they didn't. And it's perhaps a reminder that it's not going to be as as simple or straightforward as oh well, we've got no. we've got two games in hand. Barnsley are, are just as good, if not better, than us um, at the minute. And um, uh, if we want to want to topple any of these teams, we're going to have to be at our peak. Yeah, I think we probably do well to remember that. Sutherland at many times this season have played quite poorly and yet we've still got the result we need mm. because we just have enough quality that even if we are playing poorly we can do do enough to, to, to win a game or get a point and obviously if we can do that then it shouldn't really come as a surprise that Barnsley can also do that the one point above us they've got a very comparable team in terms of talent so I think that probably goes somewhere to maybe just strengthening our figures yeah, really that, that they are going to be a team that we will be neck and neck with and annoyingly they're dealing well with injuries to key players yeah. I mean Liam Lindsay went down injured during the game who's their best centre half um, they held on kept a clean sheet Keith Moore has been out for God knows how long now he's out for the season he's their best striker um, McGeehan was out for a spell did the fullback or one of the centre midfield players break his leg last week as well forget the guy's name but he yeah someone went off with a broken leg who tried mm-hmm. to play on with it so they're getting injuries to key players and and still pulling results out so yeah. um I mean they are doing brilliantly I think this now the past three games I mean they, they've, they've not conceded a goal in the past three games which is very formidable but that's nil 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 one nil that's a bit like mm. us but worse they're still in the knowledge that we have 
games in hand on them, I suppose. And they needed a win yesterday. You saw how much it meant oh, to them absolutely. at the end. So, but we can't worry. We can't worry too much about what other teams do because it's still in Sunderland's hands at the end of the day. You know, if we don't win those two games in hand, it's our fault. Nobody else's. Yeah. Well, it's interesting what you say there, Gav, about about the games in hand and about how you're not worried. I'll throw this question to you, Johnny, because I'm personally. I mean, we were seen on the way down, but I'm personally quite concerned about. Portsmouth having those points on the board while we still have the games in hand, quote unquote, that for me is quite concerning because I think now that they've secured the points while we're yet to do that, they're how many points ahead of us? Is it? Um, I've not got the table in front of me. Yeah, but I'll whip it up quickly. Hold on. Elevator Muse. <laughs> <laughs> they're one point ahead. One point ahead, yeah. right? They're one point ahead, but that's a point on the board. That's one point ahead with two games more than us. Mm. Yeah. So, but just, not, just to map. The, sorry, just to map the table out. So. The, Directly below us are Charlton, six points behind. We've got a game, one game in hand on them. Just above Portsmouth with one point ahead of us, two games in hand on them. We're five points behind Barnsley with two games in hand. And we are 10 points behind Luton with two games in hand. So I think it's safe to say we're not catching Luton anytime oh, no. soon. But I mean, I'm still very confident we can we can pick up the points we need. The, the, the thing for me with the team at the minute, um, we just seem so geared. We're focused. I mean was slightly sidelined by the cup final, obviously. But um, I just think we look so focused in what we're doing. And I know maybe we're not playing um, unbelievable football for 100% of games, but we're still we're still doing enough. And we're with, with Ledbetter, Catamol, players like that in your team, you know that you're going to be able to manage games properly. And mm. that's maybe where I'm, I'm a bit more confident than maybe some others are, because I don't know whether... Barnsley will be able to cope with if I don't know long Liam Lindsay's going to be in jet, but he's he's their best player for me, and he's going to be a big miss. I know they got through the game yesterday, but can you imagine losing your best centre half for two three games? It would it would have a knock on you would yeah. like, I think. I mean, if we lost, let's say Baldwin and Grigg now for a similar periods of time, I think we'd be mm-hmm. very understandably very concerned. Yeah, I mean our best centre half's on the bench every week, isn't he, Alex? Is that Alim? Alim, yeah, it's big Alim, yeah. Well, he's, yeah. He, 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 he's barely even on the bench, really. You know, he's coming on. He's going to come on and score the winner. In the oh, he absolutely is. He absolutely is. Like he's going to score that one goal he scored for Hearts that one time, <laughs> and it's going to be great. I'm going to finally silence all the doubters about Turk. Do you know? Do you know if we if we do win this if we do win this cup final, and I hope we do. I hope it's something like like a memorable. Doesn't oh. have to, it doesn't have to be a complete scream. I'd love it to be, but I mean Ooh. like a proper. A proper goal mm. that sends a place mental that in 20 years we're going to watch and watch and watch and watch. I mean, Ledbit has been trying his luck from outside the box yeah, he has. for a few times in recent weeks and, he, and he's, lad. He's, he's not been far off. <laughs> I think for him to just like just ping something in like off the underside of the bar and in from, oh. from 30 yards out, that would be unreal. I bet like you see the reaction if it was uh, George who scores oh, because like, like, you know, all think, those doubters. Think, yeah. oh, yeah, like George or Grant, for me, it would be the most like sentimental sort of goals for a yeah. 1-0 win anyone else obviously it's going to be great but if it's them it's just like poetic it, I mean for, for the documentary Craig will be wetting themselves <laughs> uh, yeah. um, or, you, or even Lyndon Gooch someone like that mm-hmm. yeah. I, wrote, I wrote a little bit last week on the site about like just the importance of the local lads in, that, in the team and and I'm that's why I'm hoping Sway is the decision maker when it comes to picking it because uh, I know Gooch hasn't been in the best of form and I know Hume hasn't played a lot of football but I would love to see them both start in the final for Sunderland. Yeah. Two lads who've been been there since they were little kids mm-hmm. to walk out at Wembley in the starting eleven for Sunderland in a cup final. I don't know. It, maybe that's just the romantic in us. I want to see. I want to see all the local lads playing and oh, win the game completely. And I think. I think especially. I mean, I'd imagine they'll all be grafting for a place at Wembley. Maybe with the exception of those who might think it's beneath them, like Ovier, or not. <laughs> not to make any assumptions about his mentality, but I can imagine someone who's played at the standard he's played at might might not be as swayed by the uh, the EFL Trophy final. But, but that being said, I think especially um, the local lads, more so than the others, will be grafting the legs off, hoping for a place in this in this final. The other lads will be up for it. You know, uh, Power, Greg, Baldwin, I'm sure I'm sure they would love their chance, but I, I can see Honeyman and Gooch and the likes of Hume just like absolutely just like running the legs off, just yeah. giving, you know, a, a, a 110% in you absolutely like to think, everything. Like you say, you'd like to think every player's going to do that this week. Yeah. Um, I know, I know for a fact if I was there, I would be like that. You know, everyone mm-hmm. would want to play in the cup final. But I think you've got to be realistic. There's probably only um, left back, right wing, 
up for grabs. Yeah, not many of those places in the team are negotiable. No. I think at this moment in time, I think you can't you can't make a wholesale change for the sake of sentimentality. You you have to keep some some consistency and some rationality, despite how nice it may seem for certain mm. players to play. It, it comes down to the to the fact that while someone can can give one hundred and ten percent, be a, a great sort of individual sort of sportsman, a model professional, ultimately the lad who's good and the least problematic is going to play. And that's mm-hmm. that's the way we're going to approach it, you know. I, I you know, Jack, Jack Ross is very level-headed. I don't know what you think, Johnny. What? Th- but tell you what, b- before we before we sort of segue into these these um uh, rather varied mix of Sunderland and non-Sunderland related questions, what do you think the team's going to be, Johnny, against Portsmouth? And how do you think the game's going to go? If you were to give me a team and a very sort of brief summary of how the game would go, if you had a crystal ball, how would you see that game? Um, I do see Sunderland being the team that will probably put more graft in. I mean, Portsmouth will want to win, but I don't know. I, I feel like Sunderland, uh, Portsmouth have won a cup in recent past as well, um, in the FA Cup, and that's 10 years ago. But, you know, I, I don't know. I feel like Sunderland want this more than Portsmouth. I don't know why. I just get this feeling that they do. I mean, you saw the, like, the fact that we sold our allocation out and they haven't. Yeah. I, yeah, I agree with that, actually. I think, I think Portsmouth have had to play in this competition for the last, what, five years, maybe? Oh, the, four they've years, been four down years. Here a while. Yeah, they've been down the since since they fell through the leagues. They've had to play in it a fair bit. Don't know how well they've done. I couldn't tell you off the top of my head. Um, I just think I just think there's something about this with our fans. Mm-hmm. It signifies a lot more to our fans because of what we've been through. Yeah. Um, and it would be a good way to start this new era by winning mm. a trophy, no matter what competition it is. So I agree with that. I think when it comes to the day. They're obviously going to both both teams are going to be up for it, but I just wonder when it gets down the nitty gritty whether we might want it a bit more. Mm-hmm. I think not only does it, as you say, as you both right to say, not only does it sort of like mean a lot more to us, and that's perhaps because it symbolises the the upturn in Sunderland as a whole on and off the pitch, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But I think as well, and and we've, we've both touched on it there. You, you've both touched on it there. But Portsmouth have fell through the leagues and they've been down there a while. And I think while it's quite a unique trophy, the Checker Trade Trophy, in, in the sense that it's the only tournament that is really tailored to a specific demographic of teams, mm. they they're probably a bit used to it by now. I think any novelty you might have had, if if at all, will have worn off. And like, for us, it's it's a very fresh thing to to, to enter. And m- maybe they just see this and think, right, you know, we're used to this now. We're mm. we're kind of sick of seeing this trophy now. It's a bit of a dos, you know. They put the youth teams in. That was crap. I'm kind of just sick of this now. Sure, we're at Wembley. That's great, but. I'd imagine I could imagine a fair few Portsmouth fans could give up, could take it or leave it. Yeah. I, I don't know. I mean, I don't know any Portsmouth fans personally, but and like, and like Johnny says, it wasn't that long ago they won the FA Cup, which is a yeah. proper trophy. Yep. Mm. Um, I mean, it, that won't make a difference to the players because a lot of the players probably have never played at Wembley, so it it does make for an interesting game of football. We can at least say that. I think in regards to the team, though, I think you know, go for the strongest team you can think of. I guess four three three. I'd say potentially. With McLaughlin in goal, obviously, and then 09 and Matthews at the uh, fullbacks. With, I mean, I'd personally go Baldwin and uh, Flanagan at centre back. But you think Matthews will start, do you? I'm not sure who else I'd go for. I mean, do you think Hume would get? Uh, no, I, well, I'll be honest with you. I want Hume to play, but I, I just have a feeling that the reason Rhys James didn't play last week was to give him some extra time to prepare for this mm, game. I think yeah. so. Okay. I don't think he's carrying a bad injury. I just think he's had. A, he's maybe got a niggle or a knock, and they've said, "Look, we'll go with what we went with at Barnsley." Yeah, and then. For the cup final, we'll bring James in to the mix. It's far too soon to throw him yeah. in. He's only he's he's not had that much game time. I feel no. like to, to chuck him straight into a game at Wembley, while it's not obviously a quote unquote big trophy. You know, it's it, it's it's bronze compared back to the FA Cup, but it's still for a young lad's going to be a big deal. You're backed by forty thousand Raven Sunderland fans. It's it's going to feel massive when you're there on the day. I think midfield wise, you want to go Lebet, uh, Catamol, and uh, Honeyman. Yep. Probably, and then bring on Max Power later on. I think Catmull probably will come off. I think he'll wear himself out, to be honest. I'll get a yellow. Yeah, and then I think up front, obviously, Will Grigg. Can't really, uh, I wouldn't put Charlie White there or anything. Um, who's your wide men, though? Morgan, McGeady. Gav? Um, uh, give us your, su- su- you give us your um, summary of the game as you see it as a fortune teller and your lineup. Um, I think it'll be very nervy early on. A bit like the Barnsley game when the weather played havoc. I just feel like we may feel the pressure a bit at the start of the game. Portsmouth, very good down the wings with the pace. But I don't know, I think there's, some, there's something about this Sunderland team that I've got a bit of belief in them and I think we'll ride through it. We might get a goal 
about 60, 70 minutes in and that'll be that. I think it's going to be tight. I don't, I can't off the top of my head tell you many cup finals that have been good games of football and I'm not expecting this to be any different. <laughs> no. Um, they're, they're often very tense and, and, and the teams try not to be too explorative because you can cause yourself problems by yeah. doing so unless you're Pep Guardiola's Man City then you can do what you want we aren't so I would like to think we're going to we're going to set up with one up top Greg up top obviously McGeady and Gooch flanking him the reason I've went for Gooch is just because of that I don't think there's a lot between him and Morgan um, Morgan is much of a muchness when it comes to Gooch I'm not, I'm not too sure who the better player is but for this occasion I think you pick the Sunderland Academy graduate over the Celtic Loney in terms mm. of what it means. And yep. um, and that's not to disrespect Morgan at all. I just think it means a bit more to someone like Gooch. And if we're going on form, I couldn't tell you who's been the better player. Nor could Jack Ross because he's swapped the two of them out constantly since, since Morgan arrived. I think Honeyman comes straight into the team. Harsh on Max Power, but I just think he's the team's captain. He should lead the team out at Wembley. Whatever you make of Honeyman, whatever you make of the red card he got, that's the case for me. And I think your captain has to lead you out at Wembley. You don't bench him. Um, behind him, Catamon Ledbetter, obviously. The, I'm hoping the big pitch doesn't kill them because um, Ledbetter's passing should be fine on that pitch. But Catamon, I'm, I'm a little bit worried about the size of the pitch and whether he's able to get around it. But Yeah, I, I, I yeah. sort of I fear for his pace a bit. Yeah, I, I mean, but... Look, he's experienced and he's playing on a big stage. Mm-hmm. Like I think, and he's been there before with us. So mm-hmm. you, you could get a solid sixty minutes out of him. At, at that, least. that would be fine, it, wouldn't if, it? If, if he tires, chances are by uh, by that that um, minute mark at Wembley in such like a high, it's such like a, a with with the stakes that high in this game, chance I'll have a yellow card anyway. Yeah, I think so. So I wouldn't. No, do you know what it is on that? On that, just to segue a little bit from your team selection, I was listening to Robbie Savage on. Um, I think it was an open goal podcast, like a Scottish football podcast, and Savage was on it randomly. Um, and he was talking about how um, the only time a manager ever subbed him off um, because of the thought he was going to get sent off was the one manager. He said, you don't know me at all. Mm-hmm. And, and he, what he said was is that I, got, I, I had one of the highest amount of yellow cards in Premier League history, but I got one red card in my career. Yeah. Why is that? He says, because I was clever. He says, I used to know when to do pick up a yellow card and then know how to manage the game effectively mm-hmm. and then it made us think of Catamol and if you look other than a, a, a barren spell as a younger player when he maybe got three or four in one season with Sana yeah, oh, yeah. He, uh, he hasn't actually had that many reds I think he, he really he, hasn't he, he, he sometimes does pick up daft ones but he knows sometimes when he gets a yellow card how to alter his game to be effective so I wouldn't be um, concerned if he goes flying through someone two minutes into the game. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, I remember him doing it against the Mags oh, at St James's, lad. and he does. I think you need a player to do that to set the tone. So don't be surprised if he goes in the book early doors. No. Um, but yeah, anyway, so Catamol led better with Honeyman just in front. Um, back four, I think picks itself. If I'm honest, uh, Reese James has to come in. Os Turk and Lovins. <laughs> <laughs> I really want Hume to play. Like I say, but I just think it picks itself. I think I think he'll play James, and I can't really argue against it. Um, Baldwin and Flanagan starting at centre half because that's the pairing he's gone with in the last couple of games, and obviously Luke O'Neill starts at right back with yep. McLaughlin and Nets. Um, and I know some people want us to be a little bit more um, imaginative, maybe get White up front with Greg, but I think that's something for later in the game if we need it, not something you start with. Mm-hmm. Like I say, cup finals, tense, nervy affairs. You have to just make sure you. You get you ride through the first forty five without without conceding a goal, and then make your plans for the second period. And I think that's what I like to see us do. Yeah, I agree. I think that's how it'll go. I think, as you say, you're totally spot on that the vast majority of of cup finals that you go to, when one of your teams is one of the teams there, it, it's the the general standard of football. It's very sort of hesitant. It's very cautious compared to what it normally would be. Both teams are very aware that maybe one fatal mistake. And then you're one of those teams who get shown on the Sky Sports highlights reel because they lost when three 0 down at Wembley in the first mm. half. You know, you know those like sort of like EFL greatest games that they have on Sky Sports football yeah. now. Yeah, and it was one of those teams now if that happens. But I think players are very aware of like just how much how much of a catastrophe losing at Wembley can be if you lose because you just made the wrong decisions and you let sort of your nerves sort of snowball from there. In a normal game, if you go behind, it's gutting. But I think at Wembley it can be devastating because you just know that like you've got so long to get back into the game and then your chance is gone for the 15 years. So mm-hmm. there's, a, there's an awful lot at stake there. I think both teams will be quite cautious. 
And I think it'll ultimately just boil down to who's going to take the, the seldom chances that come up. I do, you know, in the spirit of being optimistic, I do think that'll be us. I think there's very, very little between us and Portsmouth in a game like this. But I think spurred on by the home fans and maybe just spurred on by that core of just really well-spirited young lads who've been at the club since they were Bairns, I think that'll be what gets us through that, that sheer like, true grit and determination. I think first 45 will probably be quite a stagnant affair. I think now Is James that, Vaughan injured or not? James Vaughan, I hope so. He, he wasn't on the bench last couple of games, I don't think. <laughs> He's just crap. The, more importantly, though, I noticed that um, Ronan Curtis has been injured, who's one of their best players. Yeah, he's very I good. think he scored against us down there, didn't he, yeah. the winger? Mm-hmm. I think he's had an injury. But right. again, you, players like that, such big players, if it's a knock, they'll find a way to play in a cup final. Yeah, um, I think so. That's why I worry, like, when I James Vaughan be fired up for this because it's Sunderland. And, you know, Can I'm you, just, oh God, don't say that. You know what's yeah. going to happen now. Yeah. yeah. He's going to come off the bench and he's... <laughs> <laughs> I think James Vaughan would thoroughly enjoy the opportunity to, in no way at all, justify the stick he was getting by scoring a goal against us. I think... And then, Cup and easier. Yeah, I think. Yeah, I think. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's the way. Some. Yeah, you know what? I did get two goals in twenty-three appearances, but I've scored, and, and, <laughs> and it'll prove a point that no one understands. But no, that won't happen, Johnny. No. So you, best not. So you'll, just, you'll stop that right there. Yes. Say that again, and you might get muted. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's, oh, well. that's not a threat. That's a promise. This, this is a James Vaughan free zone. So he's, yeah, he, so he's not going to play. Okay. or at least he's 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 not going to score at the very least but I think yeah after a fairly flat affair for the first 45 around the 70 80 minute late 70 minute mark early 80s I reckon Grant Ledbitter outside the box just going to ping one in from 30 yards off the other side of the bar and in and that's going to be your jobs are good and I think it'll just take a screamer that would be beautiful to, to put it away no team I've said it before on this pod no team is immune from a screamer. You can be as resolute as you want defending, and I'm sure Portsmouth will to soak us up and hit us on the counter. But you can be as resolute as you want. No one is safe from a goal like that, and that's exactly the kind of goal I think we're going to get. I think it'll be led better, and I think it'll be one nil. It'll be a, it'll be on paper a fairly boring game, but it'll feel so good at the time when we come away with that trophy. I think it'll be tremendous. So I think that's probably a good place to leave the uh, actual constructive dialogue about football and start talking about all this random crap we've got here. So (laughs) we asked on Twitter, I believe, let me find the date. Yes, we asked on the 21st of March at 12.05pm for any (laughs) question at all, your your best or funniest questions that can be SFC related or not. And let's see what we've got first. The first one is, if your handy had balls, would she be your uncle? But she doesn't, so she's not. Do you know what I'm trying to say? That's the, basically, I don't know if you know, that's from a YouTube video from a Liverpool fan TV. Oh, that's the question. Is it? So he's like, because he was talking about Sadio Mane being the best footballer in the world. He's yeah. like, but if your auntie had balls, she'd be your uncle. But she doesn't, so she's not. Do you know what I'm trying to say? See, I talk about absolutes. <laughs> that was basically it. Oh, it's also it's a reference. Yes. Oh, fantastic. Oh, right. Yeah, okay. <laughs> but See, I, to I, answer I, the question. Yeah, I, I was going to go for like a literal answer here. But um, down, you take it? If my auntie had balls, no, she would be a hermaphrodite. <laughs> But would them, you still call them anti at that point? I don't, I don't know. I don't know because I don't actually call them anti anyways. I'm just like, yeah. oh, it's like Pat. Pat. No, actually, no, I do. I say anti. I think we need a 5,000 word essay. Yeah, I, I on think so. Report. I think so, yeah. I think this is how, if you're listening to this podcast and you're interested in becoming a, a writer for Roker Report, um, submit a 5,000 word essay on the following question from Michael Earls. If your auntie had balls, would she be your uncle? The most incisive replies um, will be shortlisted, and then we'll ask you this question, which is <laughs> the mullet. Discuss. I don't like it. Watched in general. If you're just talking about the mullet, I don't like it. No. no. That dog, the bounty hunter, looks pretty cool, and he's got yeah. one. I don't but know. generally, no. No, I feel like I feel like the when I, when I think of like a mullet, I think of like a thirty year old man on like an eighties sort of like grainy video. Chris Waddle. Yeah, with like a, with, with, with with like a wispy like pencil moustache and just like baggy clothes and I just feel like it's a bad look I just feel but like any, it's, it's a very greasy look anyone still rocking the mullet in uh, 2019 deserves a bit of credit like, I think so I think because you must get some torture like oh I yeah I think you deserve deserve to be commended for your character if not for your sense of style but you know Gav actually has a mullet I don't 
No, he doesn't. <laughs> no, right. no, he definitely doesn't. <laughs> yeah, any more thoughts on the mullet, Johnny? And anything else you want to? It's just a no from me. It's just a no. Yeah, I feel like it's for me. It's a categorical yeah. no. I don't feel like the mullet's ever looked good on anyone. Who asked that? We didn't say that. Uh, yeah, <laughs> someone called Wheeze Keys seventy three. So, I wonder yeah. if he's got one. I wonder if that's why you ask. Uh, well, I mean, I'm, I'm sorry. So if we've offended you, sorry, mate. Yeah. But I, I, like I say, I think I think you deserve respect if you have yeah, got one. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 yeah. I, I mean, I don't agree with your choices, but I respect them. So if, if that's if that's what if that's what you're about, then no, wait, no, that's not Waste Kiss seventy three. That that's Darren Elliott. Sorry, I was looking at the wrong name. You're accusing the wrong person. I, I am. I've now. accused the wrong person. Mullet related. Yeah, uh, that that is a incident. Yeah, well, yeah. that's a strong sort of mullet accusation. You know what? You, you know, have you ever thought that maybe the report could do with like an athletic or min style segment, where we just sort of like have like a, a fictional character that has some like re- really weird quirk <laughs> about them, or like a real character who's given some awful fictional representation, like Peter Beardsley. Do you reckon we could have like a Peter Beardsley, like with like a Sunderland player, play some like sad music and then have him talk about how his wife's kicked him out? Simon Grayson. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Simon Grayson. Jack, Jack, who writes for us, does a really good oh, it Grayson impression. Yeah. He sends random voice messages in our group chat of Simon Grayson talking shite. And they're and really good. We should probably podcast them actually. I think so. I think if, if we can like find that like sound file that like Bob Mortimer uses for, for Beardsley and just put like a nice story about Grayson over that, I reckon it would work wonders. Because the, the, the two sort of like characters can be like manipulated to be like the same sort of thing aren't they it's just sort of like we're gonna rip it off yeah it's just i don't know like, shout out to uh, jam sarney's impression of uh, simon grayson as well oh that was really good as well yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, jam sarney's was good in that little sketch he did i quite enjoyed that anyway so i guess we can go from the one that's from Wee's key 73 the the man i am almost accused of owning a mullet but no i, I don't really get this one but i suppose it could be open to interpretation what's the best rapport or airport when we say rapport, do we mean the Roker rapport or just the concept of having a rapport? And are we comparing this to just airports in general or the mag sort of joke of them having Do I prefer... No, I wouldn't read too much into it. Yeah, What's better? Know. Rapport, as in having a rapport. I like having the rapport. rapport because we actually have one. We don't have an airport now, do we? No, so, that's true, yeah. Mm. Uh, yeah. Well, we, we, to be fair, we don't have an airport. I'm surprised that we can make international signing because how do they find Sunderland Airport? You just don't understand, man. I, honestly, you don't. Yeah, absolutely I'm good. going for rapport. Rapport, yeah. yeah. Rapport yeah, for I me. Think, yeah. I think I think air, airports are good, and I'm sure as a mag you would say that airports are very good because we don't have one. Much how like we also don't have two Nando's and only have one Nando's. You know, <laughs> mm. there are obviously many attributes that we lack that that the mags have. They I'm have sure two they KFCs. Say, we have one. Oh crap! I know oh, we have two now. That. Actually, so we're level on. That I one. have oh, it God, equalized. Right. Yeah, I love it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> equalized with the KFC derby. <laughs> Tremendous. But no, I reckon. I reckon. Yeah, airports are good. But um, uh, Sunderland City Council own sixty percent of Newcastle Airport, so um, uh, you can swivel on that. So the report wins. <laughs> Have it. SCFC Bronco says, "What's your favourite Sunderland chant ever?" I used to like John o- John Oster. Used to be shite. Now he's all right. Walking in an Oster Wonderland. She is ask? a wanker. Yeah, that's sorry, yes, four, but yeah, that's my favourite song. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. For me, it's Triple C says chant. Oh right, Triple C says someone's number nine. I yeah, love that one. I that was that. that was a good one, but I don't know. I don't know. I think there's, like, some, there's some good old ones that don't get sung anymore, isn't there? Mm. That, would, that would need to make a comeback. Like the CCA one. Mm-hmm. If we can give that to someone else, I can't give it to Will Greg because you know he's kind of taken mm. when it comes trying to, to the think chance. of who would that would fit with actually. Uh, Duncan Watmore. He's got ginger hair. Duncan instead of... Watmore. Someone's no. number 14. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's not going to come off for you. Who's number 10? Oh, Honeyman. Uh, I don't know if it works. George no. Honeyman. No, not a chance. Ah, that's crap. It needs a bit of thought. This lad's not on a yeah, podcast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I feel like... We'd, we'd, Charlie Wyke, someone's number 9. There you go. Yeah, but no. you, 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 you'd have to be like able to score goals first, though. Yeah, well, Hull City used to use it for Giovanni, of all people. Yeah, but that, that works, a random though. One Giovanni on. works. Yeah. Like, it's, got, like, it's like the right syllables, like the right sounds for it. Mm. I feel like I feel like we don't have like the creative capacity to think of this now on the pod, so we're gonna have to table that and come back yeah. with it later. Yeah, lads. By all means, lads, have a big old think while I read that's, the rest. That's of a them. segment as well we could start doing. Like, if we come up with a new chant, do it on here and see yeah, if we can trend yeah. it. Yeah, then yeah, like we'll, <laughs> we'll take recommendations of people's chants and I'll sing them out. Uh-huh. Except that I won't do that because it'll sound awful. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, yeah, Mac Aminio says, if we get promoted, do you think this squad is strong enough for another promotion push in the championship? If not, what changes would you make and why? So I think I'll start with this one. And I'm going to say no, like quite quite confidently no, that it was, if this team goes up again, so if, if this team goes up, it's it's not going to go up again. Not, not, not with the sort of financial backing that we don't have at the moment and not with the fact that there's, there's still play. There's, there's a lot, there are a lot of players in this team that I think probably couldn't really cut it in the championship. 
Correct. So I, yeah. I, yeah, I think that if we get promoted, then we will be focusing on adding the players needed to maybe stave off relegation rather than push for promotion. I think that's a very ambitious leap. And I think with given how sort of formidable a competition the championship is now, you, you, it's, it's, we, we don't really live in an era where you can go League One, Championship, Premier League. Nah. We, we, I mean, that, the, the last of the teams to do that were probably like Hull. Sheffield United are up there challenging, I guess, and um, they are. They, they've done. The, they've the, done very well, but they're they're an anomaly. They're, they're yeah, there. there's, yeah. It it doesn't really happen anymore, and I think for us to stay, I'm, I I hit, no one is. I'm one. I'm one of these. Who I hate talking about what we might do when we get promoted. We haven't been promoted yet, but yeah. let's just for the sake of the question. Um, let's assume that we're promoted yeah, now. Yeah. No, I think we've maybe got a small handful of players capable of playing Championship football, mm-hmm. and that's being kind, actually. Um, yeah. And there's all sorts of other issues we'll have to deal with if we do go up, which is, of course, looking at players who've got massive wages and getting rid of them, mm-hmm. replacing those. Some of those are actually were better players, like Catamol and McGeady and whoever else. Arguably so, Oviedo. Yeah, there's so many problems to work with there. I think when you look at some of the teams who can't get promoted and have spent a fortune, it just shows you how difficult it is to get out of that league. Absolutely. And even if you look down the bottom end and you see that you probably need about 50 points to stay up. Yeah. I mean, it's it, it's a tough league. Yeah, I would take it one you step know. at a time. I would focus on consolidating your place in the championship before you build on that. I think if, if anyone comes up thinking, yeah, we're going to go for back-to-back promotions and you, you, you're going to be in for a rude awakening when you come to your third game and you're getting home 3-0 off someone like Aston Villa or Bristol City, because that'll happen. That'll happen when you go mm. up. You, you, you could have a good start of the season, but you'll you'll play a team who are competing in the top half, who are competing in the playoffs or the automatic spots, and they'll play off the park. That'll happen at least once yeah. in, the, in the early stages of the season but, because you're not going to be able to add... We're not going to have the financial resources to make this team into a top-half championship team immediately. We can build on it, absolutely. It can be a work in progress, and I'm sure we can do fairly well in the first season back, but you've got to look at... Realistically, you've got to look at the teams that do go up. I mean, look at Rotherham. You know, they're, they're doing all right, but ultimately they've just come up and they've had to make adjustments and now they're fighting relegation there. Wigan too, Wigan yeah, on Wigan too, too, yeah. yeah. We should strive to be a bit better than that for the first season back. I think we should strive to stay clear of the relegation zone and try not to get pulled into a relegation fight. But I think people fail to realise how big a gap it is now between these two leagues. Yeah. And then the it's Premier League massive. is the same gap between the Championship and the Premier League is the same sort of gap between Championship and League One. Um and people fail to realise that <laughs> actually like, you know, teams like I don't know, Millwall or whatever, uh, are much higher standard than teams like Wigan. Mm-hmm. Um, they're not the same level which some people yeah. might think they are but they're not you see um, I, I, I might even argue that the, that the the gap between the championship and league one is actually more sort of gaping than the gap between the Premier League and the championship I think if you were to swap the bottom three teams in the Premier League with the top three teams in the championship then both divisions will become more competitive and that sort of that would be like, an, like that would be indicative of, of, of the fact that what I'm saying is true Whereas if you were to do the same with the championship in League One, then the divisions would be like even more dramatically so. Mm. I think if you were to take us and put us up there, we would struggle more. Sorry, no, yeah, no, it, it would be less competitive in the sense that we would struggle more if we went up. And if you took the bottom of the teams and put them down, then they wouldn't struggle as mm. much. I feel like I've not really sort of conveyed that. <laughs> I know what you mean. As, mm. in, in like the best way possible. But I think what I'm getting at is is that the best teams in League One would struggle more in the bottom half of the championship than the best teams in the Chambo would struggle in the bottom half of the Premier League. Yeah. Well, you heard what Phillips yeah. said on the podcast, didn't he? Did Kevin Phillips, he mentioned how like we didn't go up the first time because we got beaten in the playoffs. Yep. But we're doing much better the next season, flying mm-hmm. up that league, and then we'll finish seventh in the Premier League. And uh, maybe going up, maybe not going up is not as bad as people think it is, yeah. in my opinion. But yeah, that team's not good enough to stay up, uh, not uh, good enough for another promotion, no. No. I, th- I would be a little bit worried if we didn't go up over through because all these changes that would have to happen in the summer anyways regardless of what league in, we're in could be detrimental if you stay in League 1 Definitely. so the club obviously are completely focused on promotion and nothing else mm-hmm. um, I think promotion is very likely but again I think with questions like those you have to remind yourself at some point that it's not a foregone conclusion that you're going up you can speculate all you want about Sunderland's life in the championship next season but it, it, it's not it's, it's far from nailed on Mm-hmm. It, it, you know, you, you could you, you could get beaten in the playoff finals or, or whatever or just not get promoted one way or another and then you've got to focus on how are you going to change your team how are you going to make adjustments so that suddenly those wage bills racking up aren't a detriment aren't a bigger problem that, that, that there were before because I think it's easy to forget that players like Oviedo and Catamol 
they're eating up wages that are going to be harder and harder to satisfy the small the budgets coming in are. And mm-hmm. obviously, with staying in League One, you're going to have less revenue, less of this, less of that. You know, just general less financial stability. And so you're going to have to change something one way or another because mm-hmm. I don't know how easy it's going to be to move Catamol. I think Oviedo you can probably move, but it's just it, it's just logistically it'll cause more problems than solutions. Mm-hmm. But anyway, I think we'll we'll leave that one there. Mac and Matty says, name the ultimate five-a-side team with only players who played for us during the Ellis Short era, which is bracketed 2008 to 18. So the best Ooh. five-a-side team with players from <clears throat> 08 to 18, players oh. who we've had under Ellis Short. So for this one, you can't include Roy Keane's players when they were first promoted. Right. I presume. Oh, well, the, so we'll yes, start, yeah. if they were still here in 20... So uh, can you include players that were um, signed before Ellis Short came in, but were still there when he was here? Yeah. Yeah, because so, they were like there in the Ellis Short era, weren't they? Mm. So we'll start with you, Johnny. Who, what's right. your ultimate five-a-side team here? Craig Gordon. Craig Gordon. First of all in goal. Um, yeah. Let's see. Up front, well... Darren Bent mm-hmm. has to be. Has to be. Uh, yeah, and I'm probably going to go two uh, midfielders and two defenders. So what? Five aside? Oh, of course, not of course. <laughs> All right, one midfielder. Uh, see, are the ah oh, oh, yes, the classic six lads on the five aside. <laughs> Tell you what, little segue, right? Two defenders, one midfielder. That's what I'll yeah. say. But, yeah, go on. yeah, sorry. No, this is a really good story, and I feel like this is probably the most opportune time I can tell it on the Roker Report because there's nothing really important at hand to talk about. But um, <laughs> my like. My old five aside team with myself and Jake Hanna, another Roker Report member who um, uh, who is thankfully not on this pod because he'd, he'd have his head in his hands at the moment when I'm telling this story. But we had a five aside team and we were terrible. We were we were without a doubt the worst five aside team in the 16 to 18 student league when we played when we were in sixth form. We were so bad. We were terrible. What we did one game is a way to try and like we'll play another team who were very good and obviously weren't a very observant team either because what we did was we had two lads who were subs no, so we had three lads who were subs and five obviously on and five aside and your story reminded me of that mm-hmm. and the classic strategy of playing six because what we did was during the game like we were getting like humped again like I'm sure we were like 10 nil down at one point so we just like opened the gate and just like just put someone on like every now and then and just like see if they noticed um, no word of a lie we got eight lads on the pitch and they just didn't notice we got eight <laughs> lads on the pitch so I don't know whether that's like a, a, scored a, another ten yeah honestly, <laughs> honest, I mean, to be fair like the, the frequency of their goals didn't change like we started getting in each other's way so like that strategy just didn't work <laughs> so I think we'll have uh, say Craig Gordon go Darren Bent in, uh, in up front not in defence Darren Bent up front uh, Coney and uh, Kabul this year centre centre halves. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm going for most of the Sam Allardyce team in this point, and then Yannam V in midfield. Mm, that, that's a very, five a side. We can pick a better one. That's, that's a very, a, that's a very Allardyce team. I'm yeah. going pick that in goal because his feet are magnificent. Yeah. Um, I that, want Sessegnon, Malbronk, and Aidan McGeady with one defender being Nairon Nosworthy. <laughs> <laughs> was he still here in 2008? I think he was. Yeah, Nairon yeah, yeah, was, was here until like 2010. I just he just want, didn't play. Because <laughs> he can run around like a nutcase. And oh, mag- okay, mag- like imagine how much work he could do with it on a five-side pitch. Oh, he'd have to <laughs> a unit. So he, those three in front of him could just do what they want. Yeah, the worst teams to play in five-a-side were just like, well, I mean, in, in the student league, when you were 17, the worst teams to play were the teams of quite obviously blokes in the mid-20s who weren't students and just fancied kicking lumps out of a bunch of bands because it was easier. Nairon's that kind of look in five aside. Yes. Like technically not not gonna be as good as some other maybe like fictional sort of professional five aside teams that you're playing <laughs> against. But like crikey, with that like small amount of space you just run around booting everything and it'd be, it. it'd and then, be, it'd and be then just let, to watch. And then just let Steed McGeady and um yeah. Sessignon do what they mm-hmm. want. Yeah, well I I think can I think if I want to beat both of those, I'm sure I can. I'm in goal. I'm going to go for Pickford again. As you say, I just think like his reaction is with his legs is the best and for a keeper in fives, really, you know, it's not the position you focus on the most. Mainly, you want, you want someone who can just like sling the body in the way when they're blocking shots from mm-hmm. point blank range. Craig Gordon, while he, he really came into it towards the end of his time at Sunderland, he, he, he sort of like looked a bit like sort of like weird when he like, dived <laughs> he looked <stuff>. weird <laughs> he, he used to like hide his like limbs in like really weird directions when he went to like sort of save things when they were coming at him so I just don't think he'd be the best choice so I think Pick, it's got to be it's got to be uh, Pickford yeah I'm going to go with a, I'm going to go with the back two I, I, I believe in that that, that um, uh, defensive solidity and I am going for five aside with Michael Turner wow. and Nida Manua those are going to be mine well I can understand Anua but I'm not sure about Turner like, Michael, on, are you kidding Michael Turner in five aside absolutely like 
He's just like an absolute like. He's like a tin man though, isn't he? You just walk around him. No, no, no. <laughs> but the thing is, like five aside, you've with when you've got another centre back there to support you. There's like there's not much space. There's not going to be enough room to run around when he's like closing you down. Turner, yeah, knock through his legs. Definitely no, no. Fair enough. Then then big Needham will just like scoop it back up and just like All right. slide to everyone and score like that against Chelsea and never did again. In midfield, I'm going to go for well. I feel like um, I feel like to compensate for Turner's sort of lack of flair. I probably would want to go for Steve Malbronk in the middle. I feel like, you know, he's just gonna he could just twist and turn through everyone. And then up front it's probably just gotta be it's gotta be Darren Ben, just because, you know, he's he's without a doubt the best finisher we've had. I'm surprised nobody went for Defoe, imagine him in five side. Ah, it's just gotta be Bend. I just feel yeah. it would be Defoe if we didn't have Darren Bend. Because Darren Ben was just a more prolific goal scorer. F- like fine margins when, when you get down to it. But yeah, I guess you're no. right. Anyway, well, thanks, uh, Johnny and Gav, for presenting the second and third best five star teams <laughs> in that discussion. Uh, yeah, Actually, I want I want someone to tell us on Twitter which team the thing would win. Yeah, it's obvious, those three. obviously mm. mine, captained by uh, big big Michael Turner. It, it, it's between him and Wes Brown, really. But I think I'm going to give it to Turner. All right, okay. <laughs> okay. Well. Some exchange betting companies run short-lived promotions, like months-long offers of low commission. At BetDag, we wanted to change the way we did things, so we set our commission at 2% permanently. That's 2% on football, horse racing, golf, almost any sport. 2%. That's just one way that BetDag is changing for the better. For the better. Like you. BetDag, the 2% commission exchange. Over 18s only, please gamble responsibly. Uh, This question comes from Gav. And, um, so I'm asking myself a question, yes. Well, right. you, yeah, I mean, and I'm going to read it out for you. Go on then. Shall I do it in your voice? <laughs> if you yeah. want. So basically you just try to do a voice like uh, Connor. Yeah. If you could shoot the biggest traitor you know in the head and get away with it, how would you get rid of Connor Bromley's body? <laughs> <laughs> how would you though? How um, would I get rid of Connor's body? I'd put him in like one of those storage containers, me. You know, like those like get big ones. Yeah. Like, Wait, have you ever have you ever heard smelled burning hair before? It's awful. Well, you wouldn't get much of that smell. No, I was going to say uh, that, that was that, that was a loaded joke. That one, guy. come on. <laughs> um, yeah, you wouldn't get that smell. I'd bury him at sea. Yeah, I maybe in a red and white casket. <laughs> <For> a Viking <laughs> funeral. Just like put him out in a longboat and set him on fire. Just send them away. I'd, I'd, yeah. um, I don't know if you've seen Ten Cloverfield Lane, but like I'd put him in a, a container of acid. Oh, wow, where, where, <laughs> where we get the acid from, I don't know. But yes, that's gonna like hide all evidence that he was even existing. <laughs> sorry, Connor. No, I'm, I don't know. Am I sorry? I don't know. But yes, what even are we like? <laughs> We've gone from like talking about a five or side team to how can we best sort of like sort of, kill like, Connor, em- 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 emaciate <laughs> Connor's corpse? Well, what a funny punch! Yeah, well, I think I think what you want is you want a nice, get big like cold storage container. One that like no one's ever gonna touch. Another you know, ones you just see like like in desolate sort of like backwater towns or mm-hmm. in just like remote parts of cities that will never be touched for another like another century. You know, yeah. Mm. Well, I think if you just find a nice storage container in Rotherham, I would I would dump Connor in there, and then for the next millennia, he'll go he'll go unnoticed. In fact, yeah, what'll happen is is that that storage container because they're so like resolute, it'll survive a nuclear apocalypse, and then the next race to inhabit planet Earth. Will find the body of Connor and they'll assume he's a deity of some kind. And then in the year 3035, there will be an alien race on planet Earth who worship Connor Bromley as a god. <laughs> You've and had that, a lot of time to plan this, haven't you? That, that's, that's, honestly, this is just on the spot. I just, this is just a, a nice, a nice sort of like hypothetical dystopia I've thought of. But yeah, we're gonna leave that yeah. there because we're getting really weird with that one. So we're gonna just sort of. Sort of drop well, that right. that's, if, that's what if, happens, lads. You start off at Roker Report, and this can be you. This can be <laughs> yeah. with, yeah. if Connor ever gets murdered, they're gonna know who to look for. Aren't they? <laughs> right. right, was well, he buried at sea? It was calf. <laughs> <laughs> right, well, uh, Graham Field says, uh, Will Jack Ross be SCFC manager in three years' time? Uh, no, uh, no, I no. think it will. Depends on if we feel to get promoted in the next two seasons. Well, I, I'm, I'm guessing at some point he's going to be approached by like Celtic or Scotland mm-hmm. I think Scotland will be sooner uh, rather than later I reckon like so Scotland are going to be looking for a new manager yeah. soon they're going to be looking for someone like that especially yeah. after getting beat off Kazakhstan well, sorry are... to put a damn <laughs> thing thing <laughs> nah I, I actually think that, um, it depends who the owners are if the if the current owners are still in place in three years time then I think there's a high probability he will be because I just think they've kind of bought into um, the approach that he brings and it all ties in with the new way of thinking at the club, mm-hmm. but it there's obviously the with every manager could they be poached if we go through a bad run of form would 
Stuart Donald's trigger finger get itchy, which yeah. when he was at Eastleigh, it did. He, he had a, he had a bit of a reputation as Eastleigh only as sacking his managers. Right. Yeah. So and uh, that was something I noted from the off. Um, I'm not saying that's going to happen with Ross, but I just wonder if thing you know. Imagine, for instance, we would do go up, and next season we're sitting in the bottom three in November. Mm-hmm. Would they start to panic because the fans would start shouting for his head? We know they would. Um, so I'm going to say no. I just think that Sunderland's record of hiring and firing and losing managers and all the rest mm-hmm. of it indicates that even under the previous owner, it's difficult for a Sunderland manager to keep their job more than yeah. a year or so. It doesn't happen in football. Managers don't keep the jobs for three years. No, it's you're right. Happen. It's just not a thing that happens anymore. I think, yeah, no, I agree. I think he will lose his job in three years. In about three years' time, I would say, to be honest as well. Maybe if... If Graham Hayward said, would he be the manager in two years' time? I would have said yes, but I think about three years' time, around about then, no matter which way it goes, it'll end up somewhere else. Either I think we'll get promoted and say we don't do very well, I think there's a very high probability that Stuart Donald, as you say, Gav, you know, it might just whip out the, the, the trigger finger again, that the nerves might get to them. They might think, no, mm. you know, he's, he's not going to do it. Can we afford it to sit idly by while he takes us to relegation? They might think, yeah, no, no, we're going to sack him and get someone else. So that's one way he could go. The other way, I think, conversely, would be that he hits the ground running and then we gradually build on what we've got, similar to Chris Wilder, and just sort of take off once we mm-hmm. get in the championship. You know, maybe maybe have like an uneventful season to start with and then just from there just build and build and build. And then by the time we're looking at promotion again, perhaps in three years' time, if everything goes according to plan, then let's say Celtic, Rangers, etc. come in and they think, you know what, we want this guy or perhaps someone else. You know, maybe before we get to the playoffs, a club like Celtic goes, we want Jack Ross. <coughs> Jack Ross thinking his head's turned, thinking, right, okay, SPL Giants, Champions League, right, let's go. I think there's only two clubs bigger than Sunderland he, would, he would, wouldn't think twice about leaving us for, and that's maybe those two. Mm-hmm. I don't see, when I say that, I don't mean as in like you wouldn't leave for Man United or something. I just don't think that job is on the table. No, but I, I think I think in the next two years, if those jobs came up, he'd be one of the first names linked. I think so, yeah. Uh, I, what I don't think is that Scotland will come and get him because I think that the the the, the, the Scottish FA have, Too dopey, absolutely, man, they right. have absolutely no sense of like forward thinking for young managers. All they do is they look back every time they sack someone, right, who have we got? Okay, so that's um, Alex McLeish gone, right, okay, so then they'll, they'll put his name back in the hat, <laughs> shuffle it around, pull another rain out. That, that's the same hat they've had for about 20 years. Okay, Gordon Strachan, right, get him back in. <laughs> now, that's how it'll Craig go. Levine. Craig Levine. Craig yeah, Levine. It's all uh, the same managers. Yeah, right? David, I, mean, I mean, you know, and, and to their credit, they'll probably throw David Moyes in there. You know, they've, they've just got mm-hmm. like a, a, a maybe let's say, a, I think Moyes is probably a bit too expensive for the uh, uh, Scottish FA. Uh, that, that comes into thinking as well, doesn't it? Yeah, but I yeah, know I, I don't... I, just naff. I, I, just don't, I don't see Ross staying that long I hope I'm wrong I would love to see a son and manager here for 10 years oh. build a legacy like I, I mean we would love nothing more wouldn't we but I've just got a feeling that maybe our fan base at the minute isn't as patient as there would need to be for something like that to happen and yeah. rightly so I mean this is a big club and we shouldn't be playing in League One and if we don't deliver re- immediately there's going to be questions asked and mm-hmm. I think that's where um, I think that's where a manager's faith can be decided yeah yeah I think that's fair enough to say Right, the next question comes from... Who, what do I want? Who do I want? You know what? I like Mac Aminio. He's got another good question, which is, um, uh, do crabs think that fish can fly? B- what? <laughs> think about it. Right, you're a crab, right? You're you're in the ocean, and then you look up and you see this this little sort of like tube-looking creature sort of like drift in front of you. I don't even know how to answer a question like that. I think, um, I think they can, mate. Pro- I think, look, probably not. You've just, got to, you've just got to put yourself in the shoes. In in the claws and the cheating of uh, of that of that crab, and you got to think right. I'm a crab. I'm in the ocean, and I see that fish just like sort of like drifting lazily above my head <laughs> with like no sort of anchor to the ground, like I've got with my little claws, my little my little stubby toes. I'd think, yeah, yeah, that 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 that, that geezer can fly definitely. <laughs> so that that's that's that. That's your question answered. Thank you very much and good night. What else have we got? Uh, John O. The Magnum says beans on a full English. Yes or no? Yes. 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 Because yes, you, yeah. you, you need something to. Mop up with your toast, don't mm-hmm. you? Yeah, definitely. Otherwise, do you have beans and tomatoes, or just yes? One? Yeah, yeah, me too. I yeah, I have like grilled tomatoes. Mm-hmm. What? Which is the best kind? You're of weird, you like oh, tinned, no, tinned tomatoes. Shocking. Tinned. Sloppiness. A- anything from nothing good. Apart, well, apart from beans, nothing good comes from a tin. Tomatoes, custard, no, no. rice pudding. Your least no. favorite part of the uh, full English, then? What is? It? Oh, that's a good one. Mushrooms. Yeah. Okay. Although I yeah. wouldn't order a full English with mushrooms, I would just get something no. else. Like if I had, so like if I had a bit wish with mushrooms, I'd probably like probably leave the mushrooms maybe. 
Mm-hmm. And I, and I, and I reckon I have them, but like I wouldn't enjoy having them. I'll have them, but uh, yeah, mushrooms probably followed by most possibly black pudding. I don't know. That's not right. Yeah, mm. yeah, black pudding second place. Like it's not very strong either. What's the best part of your full English sausage? Black pudding. <laughs> okay. Hash brown. <laughs> All right. Hash, is it, but then, then there comes the debate, is a hash brown part of the full English? Yes, it is, because a, a good hash brown is absolutely part of my full English, like, right there. Like, These are the good, questions that you ask when Sunderland don't play a good, the, a, the weekend. A good hash brown, if I don't have a lengthy enough sausage, can be the brick water for my beans and the rest of my meal, if you got what I mean. Right. Yes. Uh, but of course, that depends on the, uh, the length of the sausage. Anyways, is, this wasn't the question that we got asked. There wasn't. We need no. to move on. Yeah. Sorry, yeah. <laughs> bleating on say. about full Englishes. Right, Peter Harwood says, is the earth really actually flat? Yes. Are you a flat earther? Uh, yes, I am a... Actually, no, wait, no, I'm not, because no, I'm going... Right, listen, I'm not... Actually, that was a joke. I'm going, for a role <laughs> in, I'm going for a role in teaching, so if you're a prospective employee, I'm not a flat earther, and I will teach the kids science properly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but no, but I mean... Yeah, there's actually okay. a flat earther who's decided that he thinks the earth is actually a donut ship. <laughs> so so what, 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 so what, what? So there's just like nothing in the middle? Uh, yeah, essentially, yeah. Fantastic. So. It's good that. No, I, I, I watched like a video on like some like actual like some like this this like probably this like absolute looper of a flat earther who was going on about like someone was saying yeah but if the earth's flat like why don't we fall off the end? He's like there's an ice wall. There's a big ice wall going all the way around. <laughs> I'm just like what? So like if we just all, like chip away at this wall, we can just fall out into space. He's like yeah yeah, but really strong wall, big big strong ice wall. Couldn't get through it. <laughs> yeah, I've got I've got oh, no, no argument in this debate. I don't I don't really care. The, the earth is round as far as I'm right. concerned. Like, All right, well, that, that's it. That's, that's I've that. been to space and I've seen it. Fair enough. <laughs> Fair enough. Right. Uh, Dave B says, did Connor Bromley take anything when he left your studio for the last time? I'm trying to think what he could really take. He took he my would... happiness. Um, he, he didn't take anything tangible, but he took all of my positive emotions. Yeah, he took his dignity. He took his what? His dignity. Oh, he took, yeah, he did. Yeah, he took... Mm-hmm. took and... That, um, that a strand of Stuart Donald's hair that was stuck in the chair that he usually sits in. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I mean, yeah, I suppose we should probably just like show the scandal for what it is while it's here. Um, <laughs> the, our guests, obviously, many of them have hair, have a tendency to perhaps, as you do as a human being, maybe just like shed the odd bit of hair, maybe just I don't know on the table, on the on the floor, on on, on the on the chair, wherever. Connor um, hung, hung behind every session, and he would take a strand and he would add that strand to his own scalp. So if you would look at Connor closely, then you would see a small gallery of hair congregating on the back of his head, where the, where the male pattern baldness began. <laughs> yeah, that's what it is. That's how it happened. That that's how it happened, and that's how it's still happening. So if you're if you're Luke O'Neill, or if you're if you're Charlie Methvin, that I would I would keep an eye on where you're shedding your hair. I actually feel a bit sorry. Just to go off on a tangent, yeah, like Con- I feel a bit sorry for Connor. Everyone's calling him Fat McGeoch. Have you noticed that? <laughs> yeah. Everyone's telling him he looks like Dylan McGeoch with fat. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, the poor man. <laughs> Just trying to earn an honest living and he's getting a, oh, yeah. <laughs> getting a ripped out of him. <laughs> it's all love that so much. <laughs> I, I actually, yeah, yeah. It, it was like one tweet which got loads of likes and now lo- like whenever he's mentioned now <laughs> he gets a McGeoch comment. <laughs> it's, oh, it's just so good. So what Sunland... Uh, Sunland's media department need to do with some sort of like YouTube feature with Connor oh, and McGeoch. You know what they need is they need to have like you know how like every player gets like a goal graphic when they score. <laughs> well, on the odd chance that McGeoch gets one, just have Connor. <laughs> well, next week if Don McGeoch gets the winner, his Twitter timeline will explode. Yeah. Ah, well, yes, Connor scored. <laughs> I've got the winner, lads. <laughs> Oh, that free transfer from Roker Report so paid off. Stop picking on him because it's only us allowed to do that. Please yeah. <laughs> ramble responsibly. <laughs> <laughs> only we are allowed to torture him. Yeah, also Peter Sullivan says Connor once had hair, but I feel like we've bashed him enough, so we'll leave that one just there, really. <laughs> anyway, we're going to end with this one from SCFC North Yorkshire, who says, what's everyone doing for Mother's Day? Well, I've told my mum, my mum, that I won't be home for tea. Mum? I'm going to Tell Wembley. your posh you like, yeah. mum. Me ma. Tell my mother. <laughs> <laughs> Tell mother I dearest. shan't be home for tea. <laughs> Explain I to my mother. I shan't be home mother. for dinner. <laughs> Elaborate to mother. <laughs> I sh- yeah, okay. I won't be home for dinner, you know. Um, well, I mean, I don't know. Mother's Day, uh, I think we're quite busy. I think there's something going on in London, potentially. I found it quite funny that the no, club, uh, the, 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 that March was last week. <laughs> oh yes, yes. <laughs> I found it quite funny that um, the club were like advertising for people to go and spend Mother's Day at the stadium. And like, oh well, if you're not going, I felt imagine, imagine that being being one of the poor souls who couldn't get a Wembley ticket, so they've got to take their mom out to watch no. the match. Yeah, I can't imagine taking me mum out to watch a match. Like, no, no, it's... 
Mm-hmm. Mum just doesn't like football. Wouldn't be. Wouldn't. <laughs> it's just a. It's just like it's such like a daft excuse to still watch the match on Mother's Day. Oh, sorry, Mum. I know I'm not going to Wembley. So, uh, do you want to go and watch Sunderland <laughs> at Wembley in the stadium for Mother's Day? Did you say the Mum's Net thing that went round? No, it was like a <laughs> love mum's net. Yeah, mum's net. Some... Like, for anyone who doesn't know, it's like a form of mums. We get great content on mum's yeah. net. And um, there was a thread posted on there, and it went viral, semi-viral the other day. About it was a uh, the wife of a son and supporter asking whether she should be angry by the fact that he's going to the cup final on Mother's Day, and she seemed pretty pissed off. Like she yeah. was like, "Well." Uh, well, he's leaving us, and you know I would never do that to him. And <laughs> and most most of the responses were actually like, "Well, it's a cup final. Surely he doesn't get to do that all the time." Yeah, well, he went five years ago. Um, and then a couple more responses were along the lines of, "Well, um, just tell him that when it's Father's Day, he doesn't get a day with the kids." I'm like, yeah, yeah, what? Disgraceful, like. And so dig that out if anyone wants to f- yeah, wants, a, yeah. wants a laugh. Like I, I'm gonna have a look at that after this. I think to be honest, because that'll be that'll be good content. So yeah, I think we'll I think we'll on that note we'll leave that there. So thank you very much for um, if you've stayed for the duration of this not pod podcast. Then um, yeah, considering we started by saying we wouldn't talk about much football, I think we've done a fair yeah, bit. We've actually talked about a fair amount of football. Really, I, I thought this is this has been a lot more relevant than I thought it would. So yeah, <laughs> thanks thanks very much for tuning in. Um, and this is no way um, evidence for Johnny um, boiling Connor in acid. So, so on yeah. that note, uh, yeah, please yeah. don't take anything I say seriously. Honestly. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. Thank you and good night. Some exchange betting companies run short-lived promotions, like months-long offers of low commission. At BetDAG, we wanted to change the way we did things, so we set our commission at 2% permanently. That's 2% on football, horse racing, golf, almost any sport. 2%. That's just one way that BetDAG is changing for the better. For the better, like you. BetDAG, the 2% commission exchange. Over 18s only, please gamble responsibly.